Welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in KSP 1.0.2. We begin again with the GBN because the Kerbal gods known as Squad have drastically changed the atmosphere on Kerbin, leading to widespread aerodynamic chaos, but not at the EDB. No, the GBN did not require any redesigning at all. It did need a reduction of oxidizer in its forward tank because it takes more liquid fuel to get to altitude now and its trajectory also needed to change, but otherwise, as Valentina here will demonstrate, the design is resilient. This is Valentina's first space plane mission for the EDB, and we wish her well. The takeoff velocity for the GBN has not substantially changed. It is about 70 meters per second, or about 145 miles an hour. The, the trajectory after that, though, has changed as Valentina here brings it up to a 45 degree angle rather than the 60 degree angle we saw from Jebediah Kerman previously, and that is due to the new drag in the atmosphere, which would otherwise slow the plane down unacceptably if it was brought to a higher pitch. But Valentina will continue at a 45 degree trajectory until 10 kilometers, where she will start slowly pitching down following the prograde vector down, keeping angle of attack relatively low. And this will allow Valentina to gain a great deal of speed. In comments as he watched Valentina's first flight here, uh, Jeb noted that uh, he would try to pitch down a little bit quicker and thereby gain much more speed at a lower altitude. And uh, we suspect that Jeb will want to try that out fairly soon. This is simply a recertification of the GBN in the new atmosphere, and so we will uh, go quickly through this as Valentina gains velocity relatively horizontal, just a little bit above her prograde vector, and uh, at about 25 kilometers she is no longer able to uh, produce the amount of thrust necessary to continue accelerating, and we see her start dwindling down on the velocity, but she continues on in jet mode for a little bit longer before switching to rocket mode on the rapier. And on switching to rocket mode, you can see her pitching up. Uh, Jeb had some comments about this, but Jeb has comments whenever anybody else is flying a plane. Uh, so uh, we'll just let him show us how he's going to do it. Heating was visible from the cockpit, as you can see, but uh, there was no substantial overheating. It was entirely within temperature tolerances for the GBN. Valentina brought the craft up beyond 90 kilometers as was prescribed and was aiming for roughly a 90 kilometer orbit, though uh, there was no particular requirement as to the orbit uh, on this test flight as long as she got into orbit and returned safely. And so here we see her making her burn for orbit as you can see, this trajectory brought Valentina into orbit with more fuel left than Jeb had in the initial mission, and Jeb has already demanded the next crack of the plane. He was going to get that anyway, but he is especially adamant about it now. Next thing, of course, Valentina has to bring the plane back down, and we see her at the standard retro burn point for the EDB. You'll see us using this sort of trajectory very often and trying to hit a periapsis that will bring us close to the KSC. Lots more testing has been be done for this. However, with the lift of the GBN as well as its air brake, uh, there shouldn't be any problem hitting a runway. Of course, this is Valentina's first flight and she is a little bit overexcited, so perhaps that might cause a little bit of a complication, but uh, we hope the best for her here as she approaches the home continent eventually. And we will see her orbit is a little bit a little bit off. It is clearly the case that she is going to overshoot the KSC. Uh, though as as she descends, of course, the thicker atmosphere now means that her orbit is going to be brought down much more quickly. So it's a difficult balance that has to be struck. But the GBN has its air brake and it could pitch to a 40 degree angle in order to increase its drag and we will leave it to Valentina to figure out exactly how to do this. She is a trained pilot despite this being her first time in a space plane. Here she is approaching the home continent and extending her air brake. That does not have sufficient effect as it turns out and so she does need to go to the 40 degree pitch up angle that the space shuttle uses in order to create drag. Of course the space shuttle around Earth uh, 
travels at 7.8 kilometers a second, that's 7,800 me meters per second, much faster and therefore needs so much more drag in order to slow down. But we see her here very high over the KSC and still should be able to uh, make the runway here despite that. The key thing of course is not to land short. Uh, that there is very little remedy for. Even after that emergency braking at a 40 degree angle, you can see that she has a very steep descent here on approach to the runway. Uh, there wasn't any substantial heating now of course because with the high drag profile that she had going through the upper part of the atmosphere, she now has very little speed left. So she has a lot of altitude but uh, she isn't actually going very fast. Here we can see very smooth descent. She has lit her jet, but she is not going to use the throttle unless there's an emergency. Some air braking there. You can see the view from the cockpit here. The, the docking port does have the potential to potentially block a view of the runway, and that is one flaw. But you can see from that profile there that with the steep descent, it is rather easy to spot the runway. Nevertheless, Valentina had a little bit of trouble lining up properly. She was a little bit south of the runway and you can see her trying to adjust that here. The way she's going about it is actually making it look like a crosswind approach but it really isn't. Valentina is entirely too excited at this point and that made mission controllers quite worried about what she would do. But lining up worked alright. She was uh, she ended up in line with the runway. But the GBN is a little bit twitchy and she overcorrected on pitch. And there you see a rare case of Valentina worried briefly, but uh, she quickly got over that. Uh, yep, if there's anybody less likely to look worried than Jeb, it is Valentina. And. Uh, and somehow she successfully made herself a little bit concerned there but uh, no matter she she managed to emerge safely from the wreck of the GBN uh, for a first flight not too bad uh, we will have to work on the landings with her but uh, she should be alright uh, doubtless Jeb will have much too much to say about it but uh, let's leave that alone for now GBM purchasers working for the space program are guaranteed complimentary refueling in low carbon orbit subsidized through the space program budget. To keep the cost of refueling low, the EDB has designed a fully reusable refueler and launcher. The refueler is simply known as the GB refueler. The launcher is called Beaker, named after the famous Muppet researcher and Kerbal hero. And here we have the launch of the GB refueler aboard the Beaker. And the beaker will be used for other payloads as well. Its capacity to orbit is roughly 9 tons. And that's if it wants to be recoverable. Of course, uh, it could carry a heavier payload if it was disposable. The EDB worked extremely hard to find the ideal pitch program for the beaker's launch. However, that was in the old aerodynamic regime. You see the beaker following that program here, but it is uncertain whether that is the ideal pitch program under the new aerodynamic composition of the atmosphere. You'll see that it follows its prograde vector down fairly precisely throughout the profile, and this is optimal, of course. But it is possible that it starts rotating a bit too early considering the thickness of the new atmosphere. The EDB also gathered a great deal of data on how to re-enter the beaker and the GB refueler in the old atmosphere. Unfortunately, that information is completely useless for the new atmosphere. As we see the beaker throttling down to half thrust at 30 kilometers in order to coast up, this is uh, designed to optimize its trajectory. And you can see here it gently raising its apoapsis to about 90 kilometers. As it makes orbit here at apoapsis, you'll notice that there is very little fuel remaining in the beaker stage, in the launch stage, and that's intentional. It only reserves enough fuel for re-entry. It ret uh, retro burns, and that is all the fuel it reserves. And here we have the separation of the GB refueler 
you'll also note that there was no fairing around the refueler. It is designed so that it has minimal aerodynamic impact and so no heavy fairing was necessary which would encumber the vessel reducing the amount of fuel it could bring to orbit. Here we have the retro burn of the beaker. And you can see how little fuel it has left, but that is quite enough to bring it to the periapsis that it needs to re-enter. However, all the data we have was from the old atmosphere, and in an abundance of caution, the EDB decided to bring it to a periapsis that was much higher than the data would have suggested, so that we could avoid impacting on the mountains to the west of the KSC, which is the only situation that would make the beaker unrecoverable. Otherwise, if it uh, lands on land or if it impacts on the water, in both cases it should be able to survive. Here we see that it is in fact going long. That, that was more or less anticipated and use of the aero brakes arrayed around the beaker did not have as much effect as would have been hoped. And so we see it flying right past the KSC and further testing will bring us closer and closer to the KSC on future missions. Now the beaker does not carry any heat shield on its base which would of course add to its mass and therefore reduce its payload. Instead it has the mainsail as well as exposed bottoms of the 1.25 meter tanks as well as landing struts that are all subject to re-entry heating. Fortunately, this does not seem to be a problem with the new atmosphere, uh, and it was not a problem in testing with the old atmosphere either. In both cases, the very gentle re-entry profile uh, produced by a re-entry burn on the opposite side of the planet uh, results in very mild heating on the way down for both the beaker and the GB refueler. To avoid excessive g-forces that might rip the vehicle apart, parachute deployment is done in stages, with one third of the parachutes deployed first, then the second third, and then the final third. As noted, a landing in the water is not ideal, but it is acceptable within mission parameters, and so here we see the full parachute deployment bringing the vehicle down below the 6 meter per second critical mark and with gear extended on splashdown we see that the, the beaker is perfectly stable even without SAS but it is preferable to have SAS on to maintain stability as it is recovered. Next up the GBM piloted by Jebediah is going to rendezvous with the GB refueler and demonstrate its refueling capabilities. Uh, this GBN will then proceed on to a further mission while the GB refueler returns to the surface. Jebediah follows the 45 degree up angle on the initial ascent up to 10 kilometers, but you'll see here that he flattens out a little bit quicker and in fact uh, gets almost, almost horizontal at 15 kilometers and gains a great deal of speed at the expense of a little bit more heating. Still, the heating was within acceptable parameters and there was no indication of, of overheating and so it was entirely safe and he gained a great deal more velocity in jet mode than we saw Valentina do on her flight. This allowed Jeb to uh, coast up to a higher altitude before switching to rocket mode and he also carried with him a lot more velocity before switching to rocket mode here. With the intention being Rendezvous with the refueler, Jeb kept himself to a lower orbit than Valentina did in the previous flight. While it's difficult to compare the two flights because they end up in different orbits, uh, we suspect that Jeb did indeed do a better job of preserving his fuel into orbit than Valentina did, and we also expect that Valentina will try to outdo him and that the continued competition between these two will further optimize the trajectory for the GBN and we will produce this results for future customers. Jebediah took two orbits before being able to arrange a rendezvous with the refueler 
and here we see that he gets a encounter at 0.7 kilometers at a cost of about 15 meters per second which he used mod propellant for using his RCS system as the RCS system was intended to be uh, used solely for the rendezvous for station rendezvous as well as rendezvous with this sort of refueler system it's not typical to use the main engine the rapier and its liquid fuel and oxidizer for rendezvous However, as Jebediah got closer and needed to match speeds with the target, Mission Control asked him to use the rapier instead and preserve his mod propellant. Uh, there was no particular reason for this, uh, as the refueler does carry mod propellant, but uh, they just wanted to see whether the rapier would be able to do this sort of maneuver with a, sort of fine adjustments uh, at this point in case of emergencies. And of course, Jebediah was carrying a surplus of liquid fuel and oxidizer at this point, and so burning a little bit of it uh, was considered no problem. Here we see the approach to refueler. However, uh, Mission Control had to remind Jeb where his docking port was. He was pointing straight at the refueler, and instead his docking port is, of course, at the top of the vehicle. Uh, it was in the dark, so that's why it was entirely obvious to him. And he was looking at his instruments rather than simply outside the cockpit window. As the two craft got closer together, it was suddenly apparent that the instrumentation wasn't exactly telling the truth about the approach. This did not phase Jeb in the least, even though it was in the dark and he was highly reliant on the instrumentation. And we have not put lights on the GB refueler or the GBN. Uh, he managed the approach quite neatly. However, at the final moment, it was the case that the docking port magnetism didn't quite work out. And so Jeb had to use the GBN systems to take control over the GB refueler and align it properly, as we see here, uh, using the GB refueler's own thrusters in order to get it to make contact properly. And that's a feature of the GBN. The GBN can take control over uh, uncrewed vehicles within a certain range. And so fuel transfer could proceed. And as we finally got daylight on the situation, we see that all the tanks have been topped up, and in fact the GB refueler even topped up the mop propellant in the cockpit. After that success, the only thing left to do was to demonstrate that the GB refueler could be retrieved at the surface of Kerbin, and so it had to make its own re-entry here. So it bundled up itself, closed its service bay, and this is the GB Refueler's Retro Burn. It uses LV-1R rockets, and so the burn is very slow. Those rockets are only meant to make rendezvous and to do the Retro Burn. And in fact, in a normal situation, the GBN would not be making the rendezvous with the Refueler. The presumption is that the GBN would be out of fuel. The Refueler would actually meet up with the GBN and handle the docking itself. And that is why it has such an abundance of mop propellant and liquid fuel and oxidizer left over. It's because it would make the rendezvous, not the GBN. Here we see the re-entry of the refueler. And even though it ended up in a periapsis of 34 kilometers compared to the beaker's almost 38 kilometers, uh, it turned out it was overshooting the KSC as well. So. Once again, the EDB will have to work on its approach profiles in this new atmosphere, which is drastically different from what they were in the previous atmosphere that we had only a week ago. It's amazing how atmospheres can change in a week. Now you'll notice that, again, to optimize the amount of fuel it could carry, the GB refueler does not have a heat shield. Uh, that would be extra mass. And so it is simply a bare 2.5 meter tank exposed to the ravages of re-entry here. However, there does not seem to be any problem with this. Again, while the EDB's retro burns on the opposite side of the planet might not make for very accurate approaches to the KSC, what they do is they reduce the need for any concern about re-entry heating. And so these gentle approaches might not be ideal for landing things right at the launch pad, but the amount lost by retrieving them from, say, 20-30 kilometers away from the KSC is negligible compared to the cost of the heat shield. Not to mention the cost of building a larger craft to haul the necessary fuel as well as the heat shield. 
So the EDB will continue to use this distant reentry profile in its missions. The LV-1R thrusters continue burning all the way through until parachute deployment and here you see them finally off and as parachutes fully deployed at 500 meters over the surface we see that the refueler is at a very comfortable speed prior to impact on the surface of the water. SAS was not engaged at this point. If SAS was engaged uh, the GB uh, refueler would have remained upright but instead it tipped over which was fine. It uh, managed to remain perfectly retrievable even after it tipped over and that was the conclusion of the mission. And so we have demonstrated the continued usability of the GBN in the new atmosphere. We have the refueler system which is completely recoverable and we will continue to work on the trajectories in order to make sure that it comes much closer to KSC, preferably on land as well. And we will show you much more of that in the future. And so with that, thank you for watching this presentation of the new designs from the EDB. And we will continue providing you with uh, great new ideas in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.